Hello, IBC Church family, and welcome to worship today. I'm delighted that you're with us. This is our regular Sunday experience of worship, but for many reasons, I'm just really excited about all that God has in store for us today because we're starting a new sermon series on the book of Philippians. So welcome to our experience of worship. We're delighted that you're with us, whether you're here in Berlin or somewhere else around the world. We are the family of God that's gathered around God's word to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to find some inspiration as we are informed by God's word on how we might glorify God uh, in living for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So welcome. We are indeed delighted that you're with us. If you're not familiar with us as a church, I hope that you uh, will see this as an important core of what we're about. And if you are familiar with us, I hope that you're experiencing this. Our mission is to connect people to Jesus Christ. We're a Jesus-centered church, believing that the gospel of the kingdom of God is what it's all about. And we invite people to come into that kingdom through Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross and His res through his resurrection. So we help people find and follow Jesus. So today, if you're out there and you're watching and you're a part of this experience of worship, I pray that God's Holy Spirit would speak a word to you, whispering to your heart and inviting you to make that commitment to follow Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, I pray that the Spirit would whisper to you those words that you need to hear in order to help you take the next step of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If there's some way that we can help you find and follow Jesus, that's what we're about. So welcome to this, our church family. We're kind of scattered right now because of COVID and social distancing and all those things, but we're delighted that you're a part of this experience. The Spirit has a mysterious and miraculous way of drawing us together, even though we're separated. If you are a part of our church family, then you know that we love to talk about ourselves as being a home, a welcoming place. If you are looking for a church home or you're looking for a place to find a welcome, then this is it. Welcome to our home. We're delighted that you're our guest today. And if you are a guest, we would appreciate it if you just reach out to us and let us know that you're visiting with us, that, uh, that we're hosting you today. Uh, and let us know who you are, where you're from, and how we might help you. So right now, there in the chat in this uh, YouTube uh, channel, just go ahead and let us know who you are. Give a shout out to everybody else. And by the way, those of you that belong to our church family, do the same. Just uh, make sure that people feel welcome here in this online experience. It is a special day. We have a new sermon series on the book of Philippians that's coming up. And I'm looking forward to all of these kinds of things that God has in store for us as we worship today. So go ahead and get your Bibles ready, turn to the book of Philippians, and prepare your hearts for all that God has in store for us. In keeping with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you just to settle your heart and mind to focus on God's truth, God's word, God's presence through this call to praise. I'm going to read the part of leader and you read the part of people. Go ahead and just lift your voice right there and let your body along with your heart and your soul uh, just give expression to worship today. Lord, open our lips and our mouths will proclaim your praise. You are good to those who wait for you, to all who seek you. Happy are those whose offense is forgiven, whose sin is remitted. Oh, happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no guilt, in whose spirit is no guile. I kept it secret, and my frame was wasted. I groaned all day long, for night and day your hand was heavy upon me. Indeed, my strength was dried up as by the summer's heat. But now I have acknowledged my sins. My guilt I did not hide. I said, I will confess my offense to the Lord, and you, Lord, have forgiven the guilt of my sin. That's Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Join me as we pray this prayer of confession and receive the forgiveness that God offers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you are a loving and merciful and gracious God that welcomes us as your children. We long to know the fullness of your presence, O Lord, especially as we gather for this experience of worship. And as we open our hearts and our minds to your presence, we're very aware, O God, that we fall short of your admonition to love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We've not done that, but we long to. And so we ask that as we confess these shortcomings, that you would flood us with your forgiveness and fill us with your spirit that we might commit ourselves to obedience. God, you've told us to love our neighbors as ourselves, demonstrating in our relationships the love of Jesus Christ that he has for us. And we admit, O oh God, that we've fallen short of that as well in our families, in our places of work, in our relationships with friends, with our neighbors. God, we need to bring our confessions to you and admit that, that we need your filling, we need your forgiveness in order for us to love our neighbors the way that you've loved us. So in this time of worship, O oh God, we receive the forgiveness, the righteousness that's ours through Jesus Christ. In response to these confessions, God, you've promised that you will forgive us and cleanse us. So now as your people, as we gather here right now and turn our attention to your word, we ask that you would inspire us and illuminate your word that we might be filled with your love and eventually your righteousness as we love you and love others the way that you have called us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for joining us uh, in this experience of worship. As I mentioned, we're starting a new sermon series. It's Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is real joy. There's a number of reasons why I'm excited about this. First of all, the Philippians had a hard time of it. You'll recall that Paul had been a visitor to the city, being called by the Spirit of God to take the gospel across the waters to what is now Greece, what was then Macedonia. And there, among a group of women gathered by the river, he began the first church in Europe. And there, we see Paul ministering the gospel until persecution rose its ugly head. Paul was kicked out of the city, and the people in that region were indeed persecuted by the non-believers. They experienced hard times. What's more is Paul left Philippi and ended up in prison in Rome. And in fact, this is one of the prison letters where Paul, against the backdrop of his own suffering in prison, writes a letter to the Philippians to encourage them because they've sent a special gift to Paul via one of the key members of the church, Epaphrodites. And now Paul is writing a letter to the Philippians, a letter of thanks. But the fact of the matter is, is against a, the backdrop of all of this hardship, of all of this difficulty, of all of this persecution, this letter is full of joy. The word joy appears more in this particular letter than any other of Paul's letters. And it's amazing that against the backdrop of all the difficulties and challenges, Paul would write about joy. And in these days, these days of challenge, where our perseverance is being tested by all that's going on in our world, it's important that we hear this lesson of joy against the backdrop of challenges and difficulties that Paul has in store for us. So This is Real Joy is a sermon series that we'll be looking at over the next couple of months, and I'm excited because this book has something very specific to say to you and to me in our given circumstances. Another reason I'm excited about this is because I'm using this as an opportunity to train and equip others to share in the pulpit ministry over the next couple of months. Each week, I'm going to be meeting with a group of people that will be preparing and 
uh, assisting one another in preparing sermons for the next uh, couple of months. And I'm really excited about the training and equipping that will happen, as well as hearing from others in the life of our congregation as they bring this word of encouragement uh, from Paul uh, in his letter to the Philippians. So for all of these reasons, I'm really excited about all that God has in store for us. This letter has a key verse that we're going to focus in on, and so I want to encourage you to just memorize this verse of Scripture. Yeah, I know, it's a simple one, and you can do it very simply. We can just say it together right now. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's Philippians 4.4. 4. That theme is going to carry us through. Rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the challenges. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's exciting to see as God uh, continues to grow uh, in us his joy. Let me invite you as we get into this over the next couple of months that you take time to actually get your Bible and to read the book of Philippians. Read the letter. It's not that long. You can easily sit down and do that in one sitting. It's not that, it's not that long. Uh, well, another thing that you might do is you might join me over the next 10 days starting tomorrow in this version plan. If you've not yet taken advantage of this Bible app, uh, please go to uh, you know your Apple or Android uh, app store and download version and find this uh, Philippians study. Tomorrow I'm going to post in our IBC and IBC WhatsApp and Telegram Messenger uh, uh, places the uh, link where you can join me and we can share in the experience of reading through the book of Philippians together. So let's get into this book of Philippians together and let's look for the kind of joy that only God can bring against the backdrop of circumstances such as ours. So let's turn our attention now to the book of Philippians as we explore this first part of chapter one under the heading, the theme of growing together growing together. Listen to the word of the Lord found in Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness, that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Wow, what a wonderful passage of Scripture. This, uh, of all of Paul's letters, seems to just, uh, just be filled with this, uh, this sense of, of love and connection to the people of Philippi. And it's obvious and evident in this introductory part of the letter that he's written here. As we look at these different aspects of the letter, what I want to do is I want to just kind of show you that there is this warm-hearted greeting that we see in verses 1 through 2. Then there is this prayer of blessing where his heart for the Philippians just pours out into this wonderful prayer of blessing. And then it turns to a prayer of intercession on their behalf. Two things are woven together in this particular passage, and that serves as the backdrop for the big idea or the theme for today's message. 
Here's the big idea. Growing in maturity happens in relationship with God and with others. Let me make sure we hone in on that. Growing in maturity happens in relationship with God and with others. In this particular passage, Paul weaves together these two key themes. A deeply affectionate relationship that he shares with the Philippians, and he encourages them to share with one another, and this notion of Christian maturity. This is the key, that when we share this deep, affectionate love with God and with one another, God's Spirit works in us and through us in each other's lives to develop Christian maturity. Now, as we look at this passage, I want to just quickly uh, run through the passage, identify some key things, and then point out some important applications. As I mentioned, we have this greeting. It's a warm-hearted greeting. Paul speaks to the, uh, the Philippians in these very heartfelt terms. It's from Paul and Timothy. Timothy had a relationship with Philippi as well. In fact, Timothy had been sent back to Philippi uh, by Paul to just check up on them after they had been uh, sent out of the city. So here is Paul and Timothy together. They're pinning this letter. Timothy most likely just uh, being amanuensis, maybe even writing down what Paul was dictating. But they refer to themselves as servants. Let me go ahead and show you that screen so that you can follow along here. They're servants of Christ Jesus, emphasizing the lordship of Christ and the importance of obedience as we follow Jesus. In this greeting, which is a typical greeting of a letter of that time, Paul then turns his attention to the recipients, to all the saints. And this word saints, of course, is a reference to uh, the church, the holy ones, if you will, the called out ones. The word is always used in the plural or intended to be understood in the plural. So it's a letter to the whole church. And this word saints emphasizes two things. It emphasizes the fact that we have been made right with God. And it also emphasizes that we are to live holy lives, a theme that we'll see in this idea and this notion of Christian maturity. Paul goes on to emphasize that they are in Christ Jesus. This is one of Paul's favorite phrases to talk about the nature of the relationship of those that are believers or Christ followers. He says they are in Christ. And this is comparable to what John calls abiding with him when Jesus says abiding with him staying in close connection with him. In our conversations at our church, this is what we mean when we talk to uh, each other about following Jesus, being close to Jesus, having an intimate, close, and personal relationship with Jesus. And so at the heart of our following Jesus is this intimate, warm relationship. And we'll find here that Paul also says that's key to our maturity, our progress in maturity. You'll see that Paul writes this letter to Philippi, a very special city, a Roman city, a, a crossroads in that part of the world, uh, a very economically prosperous city. And so it has a special place uh, in uh, that region. And in fact, what we see in church history is that the church here began to multiply and, and there were churches started in that region by this church. The next thing that Paul does here is he moves into this traditional greeting, which is grace and peace. It's typical of Paul, grace referring to uh, the goodness of God, a play on a, on a secular uh, Greek greeting, if you will, but he makes it very full of Christ Jesus and the grace. And then peace, a play on shalom, the Hebrew word, and Paul tended to bring together these two elements, the Greek and the Hebrew. And he says that this grace and peace comes from God, our Father, once again, this intimate term of relationship, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Paul uses all three terms, Lord, referring to his deity, Jesus, his humanity, and Christ, his title, in that he is the anointed one who comes, the Messiah. Here is this beautiful introduction emphasizing two things intimate relationship, 
and maturity. It moves into the next part of the letter, which is a typical blessing. Even secular letters would call upon the gods to bless the recipients. And here, Paul, of course, makes it very Christ-centered, very God-centered. And he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Uh, and here he prays with what? With, with joy, with joy because of this partnership. And here's a very interesting word. This word partnership is the word koinonia. And it is used in connection with uh, a word, a prefix, uh, that emphasizes throughout the letter the partnership, the connection, the togetherness that Paul sensed with this particular congregation. And the partnership refers to a number of things here. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, they had sent a gift to Paul and they have participated in that. The partnership in the gospel, like Paul, they were continuing to share the gospel and they were faithful in that. And so this notion of relationship and togetherness is prevalent even here. Paul then goes on to highlight the fact that God began a work and will carry it on to completion. This is a powerful statement about God being at work, uh, starting that work, and being continually engaged in that work until it's brought to completion, and here he refers to that day of Christ Jesus. This is a reference to two things. First of all, God began a work. That's when we come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then God continues that work and it will be a work that is continuing until it is finished when Jesus returns. Using Bible words, the beginning of that work is justification and the carrying on to completion is sanctification. Here Paul once again refers to the importance of maturing in Christ, this movement, this growth. And that growth will continue until Jesus return. Paul turns once again to his affection saying, I have you in my heart. And it emphasizes the affection that Paul has for the church and the church for Paul. And he references the fact that he's undergoing hardships. He's in prison in Rome and he's defending the word from which we get our word apologetics, perhaps because he justified himself before Nero and confirming the gospel, perhaps referring to the fact that he was sharing the gospel, saying that because of their friendship, their fellowship, and because of their gift, that they all share in God's grace. Note the partnership, the togetherness, even though they're separate, even though they're apart. And he once again refers the affection that he has for them in Christ Jesus then enters into this prayer, the prayer where he highlights the dynamics of Christian maturity, talking about love, knowledge, insight, discernment, purity and blamelessness and righteousness. What a powerful passage of scripture that reminds us that growing in maturity happens in relationship with God and with others. Paul weaves together these two key themes, saying that as we deepen our affection for God and our affection for one another, God it works in us to bring about his maturity. Let's take a quick look at what some of those things might mean. Remember, it begins in this notion of love. That's the sequence. The love that God uh, has for us and the love that we have for one another. This is, of course, uh, the the process or the pathway to maturity, if you will. It's important that we understand that the pathway to maturity begins with and ends with love. It begins with our love for God and it continues until we give expression to that love to others the way that God has loved us. And Paul outlines the way that this happens. It says that love, our love for God, leads to knowledge. And here, this idea of knowledge includes two things. One of the things it includes, it includes knowledge about Jesus Christ, familiarity with the gospel, but it also suggests this personal intimate acquaintance with Jesus Christ. When we respond to God in love, he places us in Christ. And so we have not only a, 
a, a, an information about Jesus, but we have an intimate relationship with him. And that knowledge of Jesus, that experience of Jesus, leads to what Paul calls spiritual insight. Spiritual insight. And this relates not simply to the relationship we have or awareness of information. It refers to practical application of our life in Christ. Insight is much more practical than the idea of knowledge that's referenced here. Because it leads to discernment, where we have an idea, we have, we have uh, an understanding of what is right and what is good and what is best. And as we grow in maturity, as we move toward God's goal, that discernment leads us to do what is right, not only in purity, in the holiness, but also in the blamelessness, in our relationship with one another. The word blameless suggests the connection that we have to one another in our following Jesus together. And it ends up giving way to the righteousness that's ours in Jesus Christ. Not just because God has made us right with him through our salvation, but because he is building his holiness in our lives in these ways. Intertwined here, we have maturity and relationship with one another. How do we put all this together and what sense does this make? Well, first of all, you can't grow in isolation. If you want to grow in maturity, you have to grow in relationship with God, his spirit, and with other people. Isolation leads to starvation in our spiritual life. You have to have an intimate personal connection with Jesus and the Spirit and with one another in order for God to accomplish his purpose in us. That's the reason why I like to use this particular diagram to emphasize growth happens when God's Spirit and God's Word and God's people get together. Anytime God's Spirit draws his people together around his word and we begin to learn about the life of Christ in practice around God's word, it leads to maturity. That's the reason why small groups and our relationship with others are so important. There's a number of ways that this can happen, but small groups are a key way for God to accomplish his work of maturity in our lives. And on your screen here, I'm just showing you an example of this that took place just yesterday. Uh, last night, I had the opportunity to go online with our Farsi Fellowship and participate in the Discovery Bible Study that, we're, that they're doing. I'm training Benny in the upper right hand of your screen how to lead this Discovery Bible Study uh, in this Farsi Fellowship. And it's really exciting to me to see how these new believers are gathering together around God's Word, sharing their insight into God's Word as inspired by God's Spirit, and then coming alongside one another as they hear one another's struggles and they pray for one another and they encourage one another. This is exactly what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the importance of intimate relationship and maturity and how they go together. If you're not a part of an intimate uh, relationship that's centered around God's truth, whether it's in your relationships informally with your close friends, whether it's in your families, with your spouse, with your children, if you're not connected to a small group, you're missing out on the opportunity that God has presented for you to grow in maturity. It's important that we connect with one another in order to grow into maturity. That's the reason why you can't grow in isolation, because it begins with love and it ends in love. Growth is the motivation and the destination of maturity. Growth requires love. God's love in us that drives us towards loving one another. And, and love is a relational virtue. You can't love independent of relationship. Just look at 1 Corinthians 13. It's not the syrupy, sweet, romantic love that we like to celebrate in movies and in, in novels. There's a definite emotional and, 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 and deeply felt connection that happens in love. But it's the it's the commitment kind of love that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a virtue. It's a quality. 
It's, it's God's love in us that we, we pour out in our relationship with others. And, and so we reflect maturity in our relationships. The level of love in our relationship with others is a measure of our spiritual maturity. And so it's important that you and I would connect with one another in deeply affectionate, deeply committed relationships of love so that we might together support, encourage, and challenge one another as we grow towards maturity, living the life of Christ that he has called us to. Paul demonstrated a way of doing that, and that's through praying for one another. That was one of the wonderful things. How often do we thank God for our fellow Christians? Do you know another person well enough that they're willing to share their struggles and their 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 challenges uh, with you and, and they trust you with that so that you will pray for them and help them and walk with them through those experiences? This is one way that God has called us to help in the partnership of the gospel as we come alongside one another in these relationships. There's another thing that's true in this particular passage, in this particular book that I wanted to highlight too, is that the Philippians were participating in Paul's gospel ministry through their giving. And I'm wanting to celebrate with you as a church family that you have, through the past 10 years, helped start 11 different church plants through our missions offering giving. Currently, we're supporting John Matar and Samar Artul in Palestine and Israel through our church planting partnership with the EBF. It's wonderful all that you have contributed over the past few years. Guess what? You are partners in the gospel, just like the Philippians were partners in the gospel with Paul. You're helping the spread of the gospel through our missions giving. And I want to say thank you. Every time I think of you and every time I have a chance to connect with one of these uh, these church planters or someone that is um, um, mentoring them or helping them, uh, then then I'm, I'm thankful for our church. Uh, we're still a far way off from our goal this year, so it's important that, that we would continue to support. And if you want to give, you can give to support these ministries uh, through our uh, designated funds. Please continue our partnership as we pray and give to support John Matar and as we pray and give towards uh, the work uh, of Samar Artul. Your partnership in the gospel is much appreciated. And soon I'm going to have a video or two to show you where they too will be expressing their gratitude. The last thing that I want to share with you today as we bring this to a conclusion is just to remind you that, that we are to value love that leads to knowledge, intimate personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and insight, insight and discernment so that we might know what is right and through the power of God's Holy Spirit do what is right. So let me encourage you, as we look at the challenges of our day and age, as we look at what's going on in our world today, as we experience circumstances of coronavirus and of, of uh, racial unrest and, and political populism and uncertainty, it's important that you and I realize that God is still at work, growing us to maturity. We have the Spirit to help us. We have one another to lean on, and God will bring that work to completion as we continue to look in anticipation to Jesus' return. Take heart. Be of good cheer and hope. God will fill us with his joy, his presence, as he grows us toward maturity, even in days like this. Let's pray together as we just bring this time to a conclusion. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the way that you have given us life in Christ. You filled us with your love and you are now asking us to love one another in the same way as we grow in maturity. I pray, God, that you would deepen our relationship with one another and strengthen us that we might know all that you have in store for us. Thank you, God, for the way that you have made us partners together in the gospel right here in Berlin with one another. Thank you for 
a wonderful church family such as ours. The work that you've began in our lives as individuals and as families and as a church, oh God, I pray that you would carry it out into completion so that on that day where we see Jesus Christ face to face, we might hear the words from our Lord and Savior, well done, my good and faithful servants. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. As we conclude today, just remember that we have a significant marriage workshop coming up. Please contact Lucas or Steffi Eber, marriage at ibcberlin.org. If you have questions on the 18th of October, two weeks from today, I'm going to be leading a workshop, a one hour workshop for those of you that have completed the love membership online classes. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Continue to support our ministries, including our missions, if you would, please. Using this information here, you can designate your uh, offering to missions. You can also contribute your tithes this way as well. Thank you so much for the way that you're a partner in the gospel. As we conclude, let me just bless you with this benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, make us complete in everything good so that we may do God's will joyfully through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to catching up with some of you online here in just a moment, just for a sermon discussion time and connection. Have a blessed Sunday. Bye-bye.